Good morning. Welcome to another um, edition of the Chen Institute webinar for social and decision neuroscience. Uh, it's our last webinar for this academic year, and it's uh, a great pleasure to have uh, Mike Shadland to share it. Let me introduce Mike Shadland, and this is what I want to say. All of us have our scientific heroes and our role models. Mike Shadland is mine. In my wild dreams at night, if I wanted a scientific career that would fulfill all of my dreams, it would be to do for humans and economic decisions what Mike has shown us can be done for perceptual decision making with animals. He has set the standard very, very high, and I cannot wait to see what he has done recently. Mike, welcome. It's such a pleasure to um, see, see you. I, I use this uh, logical not at for this virtual world we're in. Um, and, uh, and it's, um, and Antonio, thank you very much for those kind words. Um, I'm going to talk to you about um, some new data. I'll, I'll start generally, but I, I think a lot of this group will be bored with the first few minutes of it. But I think if, in case there are people that are, and Antonio, feel free to just sort of push me ahead. Um, but uh, just in case there are people who don't know things, I'll give a little bit of background. But I'm going to talk about some brand new uh, hot off the press uh, preliminary data. And it's mostly collected and, uh, and thought about by this fantastic graduate student, Gabe Stein. I feel so lucky to have him. Um, I'll come back to this painting at the very end, assuming I make it in time. Um, all right, so uh, you, uh, you know, for a long time I've been studying uh, perceptual decision making, and I view it as a window on higher brain function in general. I don't come at decision making like a, like neuroeconomists in some ways, because I don't. It's, I'm, I'm not so interested in helping criminals. I mean, bankers make better financial decisions. I am. I'm interested in trying to figure out to carve nature at its joints, or in this case, carve the brain's basis of cognition at its joints. And I think decision making helps us do that, and in so doing. Uh, we can ultimately work, and this is why I moved to Columbia, work at a circuit level and try to understand how to fix disordered um, uh, um, joints of cognition uh, you know, in, in diseased brains. Okay, so that's just um, my, my motivation, but um, over the years, decision-making with, with simple perceptual tasks has given us some insight into how the brain uh, performs inference, how it integrates from multiple sources of evidence or accumulates them in some cases, um, how it trades off speed and accuracy, how it assigns confidence to a decision, how these parts of the brain also direct attention, uh, how the mind can change after committing to a decision, and very recently, why uh, t thoughts take time. It's because you can't do two decisions at the same time, and I'll, I'm not going to talk about that today. I thought I would, but maybe it'll come up in the Q and A in the discussion. Okay, uh, most of what I'm going to talk about today concerns the integration of evidence and the termination of it, which controls speed versus accuracy. So um, we use this very simple perceptual decision task, and I think I don't know how clever it was of, of Tony and uh, Tony Mobshin and Bill Newsom and Ken Britton to design this task, but it you know because they were studying motion perception, and that's actually my start as well, and um, um, and uh, but you know in every perceptual model there is ultimately a decision phase where you declare your answer, and so it turned out to be a great way. Uh, to study decision making. So the monkey or human um, will decide the net direction of these flittering about dots. There's something special about this particular kind of dots. Nothing lasts, the limited lifetime. And it's as if you're just, the, the judgment is which way is the wind blowing the snow effectively, because it looks very random. This is actually the easiest condition we ever show the monkey. Um, I'm going to talk about the difficulty is the probability that a dot is displaced in motion, a delta t later from the time it's first presented versus being randomly replaced into the noise. And, um, and that's, uh, I'll call that the motion strength or the coherence, which is the, the same as the probability. And so in this case, the dots are moving to the right. I don't know if you can tell that over Zoom, but um, the monkey can, and he answers with, a, with an eye movement to say, I, I think the motion was to the right. And he gets rewarded if he's correct. 
Um, now, an, we can control difficulty by controlling that coherence, that motion strength. We can also control difficulty by controlling how long we give the monkey to answer. But in these experiments, the monkey controls how long he's going to answer. It's a free response task or a cho choice reaction time task. And the monkey uh, indicates the eye move whenever he's ready. We like this um, for two reasons. It provides insight into the speed accuracy trade-off. And also, it, um, if for a physiologist, it, it identifies the epoch in which the decisions form on every trial. And that's been extremely helpful to us. Summarizing about 20 years of work, what we think goes on is that the random noisy dots from the periphery gets transduced by sensors in the eye and the uh, visual cortex and the extrastriate visual cortex uh, into a signal that corresponds to the momentary evidence for rightward or leftward. I say momentary because these are fast neurons that keep up with the changing world. Uh, they, you know, they have a little information and then they have the next bit of information that kind of overwrites. And so this might be the represent representation of these samples of momentary evidence, a Gaussian on its side with a mean on the positive side, favoring, meaning this noisy thing actually gives mostly, you know, more, more often rightward evidence than leftward evidence. And the idea is that neurons with longer time constants could, that are, we usually associate them with working memory, but they could also perhaps reflect intermediate states, the computation of accumulation of these momentary samples of evidence. So the accumulated evidence might on a given trial look like this random walk, or I'm going to call this a diffusion path. Um, and until it stops with enough information to choose right. It could have stopped here and it would have been enough information to choose left. And, um, and so this simple idea, bounded evidence, bounded noisy evidence accumulation, diffusion to bound, absorbing um, biased random walks, um, they're all they're more or less talking about the same thing. Um, and um, and um, they reconcile how long it takes to make a decision with how accurate it's likely to be. So to illustrate that, if these bounds at plus and minus b had lower magnitude, in other words, the bounds started closer to the starting point, then this trial would have ended in an error, a left choice, okay? just according to this framework, which is highly idealized. OK, so it turns out it, that's enough, though, even though it is a very simplified framework, um, to explain the choices and the reaction times of monkeys and humans in this type of experiment. So what I'm showing you on the left is data from uh, a monkey. And, um, and I'm showing you the motion strength on a signed axis so that we have strong rightward motion in the positive side and strong leftward on the, on the, neg on the very far left side and negative side, and then in between you have all the e intermediate difficulties. So the most difficult cases are in the middle of the graph, and that's where the reaction time is the longest. The reaction time is the, is, the, is the time from onset of the random dot motion to the beginning of the monkey's eye movement response. Okay, And this very simple formulation has an, a simple analytic solution for those times, their first passage times, and we can fit them very nicely. I want to just, I don't want to spend a lot of time on the equations, but it's, I've already introduced the free parameters of this equation. One is the bound, okay, which controls speed accuracy. Another one is a constant that multiplies motion strength. That's a, that's a very strong um, simplification. I mean, a step towards parsimony to have just assume that this is a is there's the, the, just as a matter of a por proportionality between the the coherence variable that we control and the um, the expectation of the momentary evidence and therefore the drift rate. Okay. Don't think of a drift rate as a line that uh, is a fit to a to a to a random walk. The, the drift rate is an expectation of the of the momentary evidence. Uh, that uh, you know, so I mean, you wouldn't say that if you happen to get a high value then of, of a sample that the mean changed. You'd say that you it was just a sample, and the mean is the, is what it was. But people make this mistake in the literature all the time. And there's a one other ch one other term here which we're going to um, ignore for the most part, but you need to know it. And that is there's some. This only accounts for the decision time, which is what I'm showing you here. But there are delays before the thing starts, and there are delays after it ends before you actually see an eye movement. So the reaction time has an additional term. Okay. Now, the really uh, cute thing about this, in my view, is that, is that these parameters, actually just the two, the two important ones, this k and b, also control the choice function. Because remember, single mechanism is supposed to rec reconcile choice and, and decision time. And it's a logistic function with those same two parameters, now the product of them, times the motion strength. 
And there's something kind of cool that this that the analytic solution of uh, for the of which bound this this accumulation is going to end in would be logistic. And I think there's something, and we won't get into it here, but there's something deeply interesting, I think, about the fact that um, that it's very that's very easy to have a variable in represented in I'll show you firing rates in the brain that uh, are proportional to um, uh, log likelihood ratios, which is what that logistic implies. Anyway, that's a prediction because we've already fit all the parameters to the reaction time, and this is where the data lie, which is not bad. We're just predicting choice for with just by measuring time. Um, and, um, and we've used that, we've exploited that. In fact, I think I saw Rika Pechner here. We've exploited that to calibrate Libet's clock uh, at one point. You know, you, you know, when someone tells you what time they think they made their decision, can you predict their choices? Um, anyway, it turns out that's not unique, and since there are a lot of aficionados here, um, uh, it was Gabe during his rotation proved to me, oh, totally against my, my um, uh, prejudices or biases, uh, I would say complete sh uh, um, certainty, but I was wrong, that um, being able to do this as well as we do implies integration to bound and no alternative. And that's just not true. It's possible to produce this, this, this same thing and do this with the, under the right circumstances with, say, a model that does sequential sampling and does optional stopping. That's the general class of these models. But it, um, but it might just wait until an extreme value, some, some, something on the, you know, when I showed you the, the, um, the, the momentary evidence, something on the tails of that. And that, that, that can, can fit a lot of data. And I believe there's a lot of that going on. And I think it's still it's a fascinating model in, in its own right. Evaluate, evaluate, evaluate. Oh, yes, that's the answer. But it's not the case in, the, in our experiments. But it, it's, it's amazing how much it takes to demonstrate that. We have an eLife paper on that uh, if, you, if you're interested. And I should just say the accumulation of log likelihood is not uh, something that, uh, you know, that, uh, that other statisticians haven't noticed to be very good to think to do. It is, turns out to be the optimal way to decide between two um, alternatives if you know the mapping into, from a sample to log likelihood ratio. And um, that's, uh, that, that's what Abraham Wall developed as the sequential probability ratio test. And in secret, um, Alan Turing actually, part of his code breaking in Bletchley Park, used that trick. And he... Um, a claim, a, 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 the Bayesian that survived him uh, uh, claimed that, uh, named uh, I.J. Good, uh, claimed that Alan Turing sort of wrote that down, essentially SPRT in the back of an envelope. It's a fun, fun story, if it, uh, who knows if it's true. Okay, so um, um, when I was a postdoc with Bill Newsom, we decided to go after the decision um, variables uh, and th think that, you know, that it was possible they might be represented in the brain, again, in neurons that have long time scales of their operations. And the idea was they must receive information from direction-selective neurons, uh, and maybe indirectly or directly, and that they should project to the oculomotor system, because that's the way the monkey answered the question, again, directly or indirectly. And they ought to have long time constants, as I said, something like persistent activity. And luckily, um, I think I saw Richard Anderson here. Um, well, uh, Richard Anderson told us where to go um, through his <laughs> amazing set of papers on this area, LIP. So most of my time is spent on area LIP, um, part out of, out of uh, because we just know, keep building on things we already know, and part because it's just a little, it's, it's a part of the area that as a neurologist I've always been interested in, the parietal and temporal lobes, when you, you know, are the, are the, are the they, they, they kind of are the, give us what, what I would call knowledge states or Gnostic states to use the Greek. Um, uh, when we lose those parts of the brain, we have agnosia. We don't, we don't really lose movement, so, but we do lose the ability to know about things or actually interrogate them, but all of knowledge is structured as interrogation, if you ask me. That's what the computer scientists all have wrong. Um, and, um, and today I'm going to talk about another area as well, the spirit colliculus. And, and um, this area LIP um, is, um, was the, uh, the part of Brodman's Area 7 that Richard Anderson and his colleagues identified based on its projection to um, the frontal eye field and the spirit colliculus. And uh, here's, here's a, a monkey MRI, the coronal section taken through the intraparietal sulcus, and this is where LIP uh, uh, lives. We, we focus on the ventral division of that, but that's a detail. And as Richard showed, and in, in, uh, in like all of his papers, um, you can just go back and basically repeat them, and you always see what he saw 
um, what 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 uh, what happens is is that the the um, uh, I mean I'm going to just give you an example of a monkey doing a very simple delayed eye movement task. It's the simplest working memory task. Uh, you'll see a, a spot will appear someplace in the visual field in the trial. I'm going to show you. It's going to be about here. There it is, okay? And the monkey has to remember its location. I'm showing this gray for you, and then make an eye movement to its remembered location. And so this is what I'm referring to as elevated persistent activity. That's the little spot of light represented by that pulse, instruction to move, and the actual movement. And it's spatially selective in LIP because for good reason, it's, this is an area that's providing knowledge about where to the um, um, frontal eye field and the spirit follicle is going to control eye movements. But this trial I'll show you has a red spot here. Whoops. Oh yeah, I wanted to say this, that as thinking again more broadly as a neurologist is that this persistent activity we think is the, is the substrate of many operations that we consider you know, just generic to cognition because in order to have thought at all, you have to be able to hold on to information and compute with it. Um, for longer durations than sensory neurons that keep up with a changing world and motor neurons that have to keep up with changing body, so to speak. And so it's that freedom from immediacy that I think holds the key to understanding cognition in general, not just decision making. Okay, so um, I, what I was about to say, I got ahead of myself, but this is that if we, the evidence for the spatial selectivity is if the red spot is plotted near where my arrow is, then you don't hear, hear or see that elevation. I hope you all heard the spikes coming along with these ticks. Great. Okay, so what Bill and I did was something kind of almost obvious, which was we said, well, let's give a monkey a reason why he's going to make this eye movement versus that eye movement by showing him some random dots. And if the monkey thinks the dots are, in this case, to the right, then he chooses this target, and we should get a big response. And this way, we should get a, a suppressed response. And of course, when we went into this, we thought maybe all they're going to do is to show us the response when the monkey, after the monkey had decided to move his eyes. But that turns out not to be the case. And I think the, the best way that we, that, that we can show that is by st focusing on those reaction time experiments. And this is work of my first graduate student, Jamie Reitman, where the monkeys are performing this like free response reaction time. And so we can record the neurons during the time the monkey's forming his decision, but cut off our, you know, I'll show you in a moment what happens near the eye movement, but this is during formation of the decision, and, on, you know, and we average on that, you see that these, these solid trials are trials that the monkey always choose, trials the monkey chooses the target in the response field, I'll just say the rightward target, and, um, and these dashed lines are the lines where, are the trials where he's going to choose the leftward target, really the target outside the response field. These are averages over many trials and many neurons, you can see that the responses are not the same for all the different motion strengths. That's the strongest, that's the weakest, that's one of the mo intermediate motion strengths in red. And you can see that the rate of these average rises, falls, meandering um, is, um, is dependent both on what eye movement the monkey's going to make at the end, but also the quality of the evidence that led to that. And at the end of the trial, and we're going to spend a lot of time today on, uh, on, on the end of the trial, how, how decisions terminate, um, we see that the responses kind of come together at least for the trials where he chooses the target in the response field, not so much down here. I'll come back to that. And if we break these up, instead of just showing you three coherences, we break them up by quantiles of reaction time. So these are the fastest in gold and the slowest in blue and all intermediate quantiles. You really get the idea that there's some common level they get to, about 80 milliseconds it turns out, um, before the saccade begins. And um, this is not a, a, a mechanism of a threshold, but it might be a sign that there's something like a bound, that when the level reaches a certain level, when, when the firing rates in LIP reach a certain level, that that's, that's the termination signal. Okay? Something must sense that, and I'm going, to I'm going to tell you where it is, and I'm going to make a lot of caveats, a lot of qualifications about qualifiers about what I just said. I'm going to revise some of the simple, simple language I just used. Okay. Now, I mentioned already that these responses don't come together. There's no evidence for a lower bound, if we want to take this as evidence for an upper bound. So, um, um, and, but that just means uh, what we see in the brain. It corresponds to this, that there are neurons that, chew, that accumulate evidence for right and against left, because they can get positive and negative numbers. That's what makes this diffusion-like. And, uh, but there are also neurons, uh, many of them, many, most of them on the opposite side of the brain, that, that accumulate evidence for left and against right. 
okay? And so they're mostly, they should be, and I actually will show you, I won't show you, but we know now that, um, uh, that they are anti-correlated. And, and if they were perfectly, if they were, this was accum accumulating the exact same evidence, right minus left and this left minus right, they would be perfectly anti-correlated and we could represent them on a single graph with an upper and lower bound. But the way it works in the brain is that it's more like a race between two diffusion processes, okay? Okay, so now there's another thing that kind of uh, that we've kind of overlooked, which is that when I show you those uh, F trial averages um, co conditional on the monkey's choice, that's not really the decision variable. That's a decision variable that you know, like for example, this these are these are trials from a more recent experiment, and I'm showing you now the trials that include both choices, because that's the whole idea of this of, of of diffusion is that it can end in either bound and it, in fact, can explain why it ends more in the bound that it should have ended in versus the other, in other words, the accuracy. And so these are the strong motions, the weak motions, and uh, using just color coding and, and dashing for the sign, not of the answer, but of the, of the choice, but of the direction of the motion, um, this is what we, what we often see uh, on, in, in many experiments. And, um, and so you, I've cut these things off because they get distorted by the fact that they are going to stop at some point optionally, okay? Especially the faster, the, 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 the stronger motions, okay? But what's going on in our mind is that these averages are, 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 are obfuscating or uh, obscuring, that's the word I'm looking for, um, what's going on underneath, which is diffusion. So we think what you see is the when you take the averages of many trials, you see the deterministic part, the drift of drift diffusion, but not the diffusion. And what we're imagining, say, focusing on the noise only case, what we're imagining is that that flat average, that flat gray, was really the average of, of diffusion paths. This is just a simulation of diffusion paths, okay? And they have this nice characteristic. It's like an obvious you're looking at diffusion. You see, you see them all spreading apart, but they have this, this, this structure. And they, of course, they spread apart uh, in distance-wise by the square root of time, and, they, um, and the variance goes by the square of time. Okay, I'll come back to that. Now, we've never been able to see that before, but now we can single trials, because, because we have access, you know, Doris Chow, uh, the, Howard Hughes has been really generous in trying to support IMEX work to advance these neuropixel probes that have done, um, they've, they've done, that have been fantastic for people doing work in the mouse. You can get lots of neurons. These probes have over 4,000 contacts. Uh, 384 can be um, selected at a time. And um, we're part of a, uh, Doris and I and uh, Krishna Shinoy and Tiran Moore are part of a, a group that was, are trying to develop various alpha and beta versions of these probes over the last few years. Um, it's been tough with COVID, but, um, but, uh, but the, there's a working neuropixel probe that hopefully will be available. If it wasn't for the chip shortage, I would have said uh, by you know, a few months from now, but it's going to turn out to be more like a year from now. Anyway, you choose 384 sites. And, um, and from these, um, this is an older slide now, we've, we've gotten up to 300 neurons. And because um, they're very good at tracking, you know, spike sorting along, you usually get, you can get, you, you get the single neuron that stays on like 30 electrodes or down every now and then to five or so. Uh, well, actually even to one every now and then, but it's easy to lose those with a little drift. And what, what I'm interested in is, uh, I'm going to make a bit of an editorial and somewhat obnoxious comment. I'm not interested in taking 100 random or th even 300 random neurons and decoding some property in the brain. Because I think a, a statistician's decoder doesn't really tell us what the brain is doing. And um, if you want a, a really great example of that, you can check out our, this mouse paper I uh, worked on, on how the mar mouse solves the exclusive or problem. Um, um, just as, a, as a, just a little case in point, if you ever want to argue with someone and say when they've decoded it, well, that's you decoding it. Is there any evidence the brain decodes it that way? Um, and so, but I'm interested in being able to get some small number, uh, right, you know, for us right now, this is about the range, 7 to 20 neurons that are relevant in some way, that they seem like they might be a signaling unit. And maybe we might have some external or, uh, you know, um, we, that might be by hypothesis, but it might just be also by some other property that they share uh, that, uh, that, 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 that tells us that. So what I think these multi-contact probes are going to afford, there are two things, and I'm going to tell you the first, and then later I'll tell you the second, is that we can get population spike rates on single trials. 
populations of neurons that are, would be very hard to find of, this, of the same ilk, okay? Well, I'll, I'll call them the same pool. So here's one of the early, earliest. This is only seven neurons, and it's an average that looks not too different. It's a little shabby compared to the one I just showed you. Um, but these are just average firing rates like, like we would normally do, response average over neurons and over trials, okay? Just grouped by the motion strength, okay? Again, including, tr including the errors and so forth, so we get the noise only looking relatively flat. Often it has a rise to it that's a time-dependent signal. It's shared by all the other. And, but what, what I said we imagined is actually there, because now what I'm showing you are actual single trial firing rate traces. So every one of these lines is a firing rate. And can you imagine, I mean, the, to me it was like, you know, when someone sees a protein and sees its structure. You know, we've been, you know, thinking that underlying these, 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 um, uh, these averages are these types of diffusions on single trials, but we've never, ever been able to see it. And, um, and so now we see it, we, you know, that was a, was a very special moment for us. And, um, and they have the bright property if we look across these trials. They have a variance that increases, scales linearly as a function of time, and it kind of begins to fall off of that because it, you can kind of almost see it here because you start losing trials to attrition because they're, they reach bounds or, um, or there's actually just a conditionalization by just the very presence of a bound that would cause this, um, this effect. So the conformity to the math is really striking. And if we look now at the end of the trial, we know time aligned the same kinds of traces to, uh, this is a different experiment, it so happens, but to a, uh, no, sorry, this, this might be the same experiment, but to the, um, to the saccade, what you see is that there's a lot of variance towards the end. Of course, this is a mixture of lots of, you know, the actual real time is varies depending on, on how long the monkey took, right? But, um, but you can see that that variance diminishes somewhat anyway um, before the saccade. And it's, um, if you look, if you just take a measurement of the firing rate, single trial firing rate, so you know, I'll call them sample, they're sample populations, we, you know, they're neurons that share the same response field. And, um, and, you, and you look at those at this time and find that what's that firing rate? The firing rate is uh, whatever this number is, whatever, 38 spikes per second or whatever, but the important thing is whether the reaction time was super short or, or as long as we saw, like even out to two seconds and, and further, um, you cut pretty much the same firing rate in, this, in these averages, okay? Now, if you look at the trials where the choice was outside the response field, down in green, then you don't see that. You're actually, what you're seeing in this experiment is, 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 is a time-dependent um, um, signal that is added to all of the accumulators, which we call the urgency signal. It's the equivalent of collapsing a bound. Um, and, um, and that's kind of, kind of nice to see. Okay, so a little bit of behavior we could do. I mean, I'm just going to show you samples because it's only 45 minutes and I want to show you some really cool stuff in a moment. Is that, is, that, um, is that if you look at the firing rate early in the trial, so here's, I'm going I'm to show you correlations between the firing rate um, uh, um, um, uh, at some point time t, that's what this, this uh, axis is, and, and its correlation with the reaction time measured at conditional line of being at least 700 milliseconds, okay? And that's what these co correlations are, okay? You can ignore these stars, they're for significance, but I don't think that's really correct. I think that's, there's probably more. Okay, so, so, um, and, um, so that's nice. So a trial by trial relationship between a single trial firing rate and the reaction time, okay? And of course it's inverse because the higher the firing rate early in the trial. Okay, now here's a cool thing. If it, this is a diffusion path, it's a Markov process. So if we now perform the conditional probability, the conditional correlation, conditional on, on a, a sample at 50, 550 milliseconds, this all goes away. Okay, so there's blocking, okay? And so that's consistent with the, Mar the Markovian property of diffusion. Okay, now LIP is part of a network. It's not unique. It's not the decision area. And there are lots of other areas that can take over when you silence LIP, for example. Um, um, uh, but um, I'll tell you something cool about that if we have time. 
Um, LA, so, so of course, the, the natural, we, we're ultimately interested in all of these areas. I saw uh, Mehdi uh, Sanye in the group, he's recording from the Pulvinar, and, um, and, uh, and, um, um, and uh, we, uh, actually, you know, Josh Gold spent a lot of time in the frontal eye field. I plan to go back there for reasons that you'll see in a minute. We're starting in the spirit colliculus. Both of those two areas, remember, that's, there's the projections of those areas defined uh, LIP to Richard Anderson and his group. And, um, and um, with the frontal eye field and the superior colliculus, uh, both exhibit spatially selected persistent activity, and they're thought to play a role in saccadic decision making. Okay, so um, I'm not going to tell you any more about FEF, but we're going to go to the colliculus, and I'm going to partially debunk that. So um, work, our working hypothesis is that the colliculus or, and the frontal eye field, but I'm not going to test it yet, uh, is uh, they play in a, a role in, deter in determination of the decision. Remember I was saying that we had a sign that the decision seemed to terminate on a threshold level of LIP firing rate, um, but, um, but we don't think that, that that termination mechanism is in LIP. So again, we go back to these neuropixel probes. And, um, and um, but the second, the second affordance of these probes is that it allows us to record pretty simply from two areas because we can get enough neurons where now with those five to 20 relevant, re relevant neurons uh, are in, you know, maybe in both areas and they have over, over, uh, su uh, superimposed uh, receptive fields. And so that's what I'm showing you now. So this is the recording I showed you a moment ago. That's just seven neurons, and as I and as I told you, oh, I want to say that the spirit colliculus at face value looks it looks. It, I it, let me see if I go backwards. The superior colliculus recordings again just averages like we would always have done in the past. They look like there's a coherence and a choice dependent effect on these responses, and. Um, and they happen to be recorded the same time as these. And you can see these, they, all, they look uncannily similar. Like it just looks like a, I'm just gonna expand this in, you know, and just to magnify it. And it looks a lot like these traces, okay? If it wasn't for the color. So, um, so if there's a reason that people thought, including me, that the colliculus is representing a decision variable. But this, these are the traces I showed you already, the uh, tri single trial averages. And now when we do that in the colliculus, we don't see that. What we see is just mostly a flat line, and then these little bumps, okay, that occur on about a third of the trials. And these little bumps are, they're easy to understand what they might be by looking at the same responses, but now aligned to saccad initiation. So now what you see is, here's just one trial, and then each of these traces is a single trial again. This, this is recording, I think we have had something like 13 neurons that, that um, compose these averages. Um, okay, and so what you see is that um, all these neurons, they're called prelude burst neurons, they have this big burst at the time of the saccade. And the dynamics of these bumps looks very similar, at least in the initial phase, uh, to, the, um, to the, um, the, 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 the saccadic burst. So I'll call these bumps, I'll call these saccadic bursts, okay? I'll try to remember to say saccadic, and you'll know that they, they come out, they, a saccade follows them. But you can see these come in different sizes. And, um, and they don't look anything, the trials really like, the, I think, like the um, same time lock to saccade of LIP. These are trials that were recorded at the same time as these. And, there's, and uh, this uh, one I chose happens to correspond to this one in LIP, okay? Um, okay, if you're getting chats that I'm not being clear enough, it's a good point for me to, be, to improve the clarity. I will let you know if something comes up, Mike, just, just go. Okay, great. Okay, so, so um, Gabe, Gabe Stein, he, de he d devised a, a simple um, um, uh, way of detecting, a template for kind of detecting um, both the bumps and the bursts. They look very similar at the beginning, and he detects them here and um, plots them out, and he looks at their amplitude, and they're, you know, they're very different. There's an overlap, but the bursts are generally larger than, the, than what I'm calling bumps. So sometimes we call them premature bursts. I didn't correct this slide. He likes to call them premature bursts. I think I like to call them bumps. So um, here I get my way. Um, so this is the, um, uh, the average now of the bursts and bumps aligned to the point in time that we detect them, okay? You know, you could argue we should have detected them a little bit earlier, and that, that might, that, that might uh, qualify some of my conclusions, as you'll see in a moment. Um, and this is the control it involves just shuffling uh, the time, time, uh, time, um, um, 
but part trials with no bombs or burst. Okay, and so now, of course, we're recording from the uh, LIP at the same time. So we can also align those traces to the time that the colliculus made a bump or a, or a burst. And this is what we get. So, so the, we see that um, before, a, a, before a, let's start with the bumps. Before a bump, you see this rise in activity, a change in the uh, in increase, um, and it's uh, it's pretty sharp when you when you look across you know the, um, the 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 trial. It's kind of distinctive, and um, and uh, but these are these are uh, z scored uh, firing rates, so it's hard to really get you know get get the magnitude from this, um, and you see the same thing uh, when a when instead of a bump the colliculus produces a saccadic burst, in other words, the end of the trial. And, um, and you see that basically these rates of change, these slopes, are, um, are, are pretty similar, okay? And the big difference then is that, is that this, this derivative detector, we like, might say, or this, this is, is, is sitting on a higher base rate, okay? And so um, that gives us an idea of what, what the computation might look like for actually performing this threshold operation. It's not as simple as detecting a level. It also involves this, this sudden change in the, um, what we're thinking of as a representation in LIP of the accumulated noisy evidence. And a little bit more that kind of expands on that is that, is that the probability of a bump is increased if the, if the delta, that what I just referred to as a derivative, if it's larger, but let's just call it the delta, the, the size of that, of that, of that, of that little uh, up, uptick in firing rate. And, um, and this is, the gra this is the, 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 all the data, just uh, looking, at, looking at probability of premature bursts as a function of the uh, LIP activity aligned to the to, to bumper burst. Okay, so it's in, in, in that case. So, um, so um, let's see. And I, another thing that makes us, I mean, this is just a correlation, of course, but another thing that makes us think this really is uh, an interaction between LIP and the colliculus is somewhat something, something about the timing, but I, you know, we have to be careful about that because we're not 100% sure about when the, bur when the bumps and bursts really start. Um, but also, if you take uh, the same, you look, record the same neurons in a memory-guided saccade task, um, like I showed you in the example, you don't see bumps anymore. So we think there's something about having this random walk-looking diffusion-like signal in LIP that, um, that establishes this, that establishes these bumps. But they really are like little, like, maybe I should go now. Okay. So now, um, we now think that the, that the colliculus is the um, site of the threshold detector. At least that's a now a working hypothesis. And, and maybe even a little bit about how it operates. So um, we did kind of the obvious thing, was, which is that we decided to inactivate. So we had a partner in this, Danique Jurison, who's been doing a lot of inactivation in LIP uh, um, uh, in, in other experiments. But here what we did is we decided to inactivate in the colliculus. There's little micro injections that we learned from um, Rich Krauslis. And, um, and, um, and um, and so here's what we get. I, I want to give you a, uh, I want to start by telling you what we expected to see, okay? Because it's not exactly intuitive unless you spend your life thinking about diffusion models. But imagine that, let's go back to the simplest one where I had the bound symmetric around, around the starting point, And we'll just take that as what we're thinking about instead of thinking about races. Um, and, if, and, if we, and if we make them, if we make the bound symmetric, of course, the black curve and it, you know, shows no bias. It looks symmetric around zero, and it goes right through uh, 0.5 and zero. Right? That's what you expect for symmetric diffusion, um, and um, and again these logistic functions. But the red curves represent a simulation only of making the bound. Uh, this colliculus neuron is we're in the right colliculus, and this is the 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 part of the field that we uh, think that we have um, shut down with our tiny injection of musimol, and um, you know we map it, uh, but we map it pretty quickly, so it's a bit crude, um, and um, and. Um, and and uh, what we and, and then so what it, what we predict is this weird asymmetry where the left choices will be um, have take more time, 
And the right choices don't take that much more time until they get very close to zero. And actually, they kind of compete with the longer left choices, and um, you know, and, and 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 end up having to go. They end up going a little faster. But th I wouldn't take that too seriously. Okay. Now the other thing is, if you look at the logistic function, it kind of looks like a shift to the left. But if you look at it, you can convince yourself. I don't know. It's it's a bit subtle, but there's a little bit of an increase in slope here compared to here. You can see that, like the if you took the area of the white stuff in here and the area of the white stuff above the horizontal line between these two curves, they would be different. Okay, it's kind of hard to really see it in the slopes themselves, but they're there. Okay, so here's what the experiment looks like. I mean, that's why I'm showing you this. Is, is the experiment looks a lot like this, okay? including the change in the slope. So slowing down the contralateral choices and, um, and having this weird little distorting effect on the logistic in this very asymmetric way. Okay? Um, okay, and then this is a control, the saline, and we do some sham controls as well. Okay? So um, we're pretty excited about this because it, su it suggests that the, that the colliculus uh, is, um, um, is, is in some ways controlling not just the saccade, but controlling the period of integration to make the decision, the actual termination of the decision. And so, um, oh, this is just the statistics on it. I'm, that, uh, that I should tell you this because I have to come clean. It's all preliminary. It's one monkey and very few experiments. Um, but this is highly significant, the, the bias uh, in, the, in the psychometric and that shift, the overall shift. But that slope is only uh, significant in some of the monkeys and not uh, some, some of the sites, only one monkey and not others. Um, but we think it's significant overall. But you know, I don't, if I change my mind about that, don't, don't, don't hold me to it. Um, OK. Um, so we're also simultaneously recording in LIP. Um, we're having some problems with that because we sometimes lose the same neurons of the monkey coughs in LIP. We get a bunch of new ones back, but, um, and, and we'll keep some of the old ones. But this is sort of just a very crude analysis where we go back to just looking at trial averages and try to see the, you know, what, you know, what's different. And there's really not much different except for what happens near the end. So this is, if this is some crude, um, um, uh, mark for when we think that the that you know that the that the termination occurs. You know, exercising what now is has to be qualified as to what this threshold is. Not really just the level. Okay, it involves that derivative term as well. Um, but you notice there's a big difference, at least qualitatively here. It's hard to pick out a particular point in time where things happen, and there's just we never come to the points of minimum variance as well. Okay. So we, we do think that, 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 that LIP, I think this, is, this could just be that the, the, without any direct communication to LIP other than something telling LIP, um, you know, has not yet told LIP to stop integrating. So we think we've interfered with the termination mechanism in LIP too. Early days, lots, lots, of, lots of things to mine in this and many other, in several other data sets. Okay, so I'm at my final slide, but it's going to take me a, few, a minute or two to get through it. So this is, I just warning you, it's preliminary data based on, on uh, very, few, um, uh, very few experiments and, um, and just one monkey, but um, uh, I, I shouldn't have said that. All the data from LIP was from two monkeys and, and, and several more experiments, so I'll take that to the bank. In fact, we're writing it up now. So LIP represents the accumulation of noisy evidence as predicted by these diffusion-like models, and um, I'll call that a decision variable, V of T. Okay, the superior colliculus, although the averages kind of give you the same impression, the prelude cells anyway don't represent this uh, V of T, the decision variable, and I'll, I'm going to qualify that in a second in a small way. So what we see in superior colliculus are, is a low level of activity in the prelude cells until the burst, um, uh, these occasional bumps, and this final saccadic burst. The bumps and bursts are preceded by a sharp increase in, LIP, in the LIP response. Um, they're more likely, I'm not saying this, I didn't show you the evidence for this, they're more likely at the higher coherences and so forth for, this, for that reason, presumably. The saccadic bursts are also preceded by higher firing rate in uh, LIP. And um, um, so, the, so that means the threshold mechanism is, um, um, if assuming the, the, the spirit colliculus implements it, and I think we have causal evidence that it does now, um, that, um, uh, that, that, um, that it, the termination is not simply a level detector. 
Okay, and I was, oh, I wanted to tell you about this mouse paper that I love by, um, from Tiago Branco's group, where they do, um, I didn't see uh, Marcus Meister in the group here, but, you know, they do an experiment kind of like the looming stuff that Marcus does. And, um, and they worked out some beautiful thresholding um, in the colliculus and in the um, um, periaqueductal gray. Um, so the, even at the level of uh, some of the uh, molecular level of, the, of, 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 of uh, transformation of, 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 of input into bursts. Um, and so we may be looking at that. How we're going to get to that in a monkey is an open question. But maybe we'll, we'll join um, Tiago and Marcus and do this in the mouse. Um, and um, we suspect, there's the qualifier, that there must be a role. We, have, we have, don't have all the players yet in our hands, the frontal eye field and the basal ganglia. I mean, it's known since Hikasaka and Wirtz that the, that the substantia nigra pars reticulata is providing tonic inhibition to the colliculus, and that gets released around the time that, that, the, that, that a monkey makes an eye movement. And it probably gets released in gradual ways. So that might qualify the idea that there's no representation of the, of the decision variable. Because we know that if we do an analysis and remove the bumps from these colliculus, we can't completely account for the ramping averages in the, um, in the, that I showed you before. So it's, it, I, it would be an overstatement to say that the bumps completely explain away these, this something that looks kind of like a coherence-dependent change in the firing rates of those neurons. So there might be a little bit of decision variable there, but you don't see that on single trials. Okay, or we didn't. And so um, I just, because this is a much broader group that's interested in much broader issues than the neuroscience of decision making, but also decision making per se, um, um, it, uh, I just want to point out that it's relevant to impulsivity, dec decision policy, which I think even has ethical connotations, and I've written about that with um, Adina Roskies, um, uh, because a policy like speed versus accuracy, and I think ultimately we're going to realize that a lot of learning is changes in policy. Um, we don't learn by changing synaptic weights so much, if, if at all, and uh, we probably learn by changing the more um, uh, the, at the level of circuit control. And circuit control is what I'm spending the next 10 years doing because I think it's what's missing from our field, the neuroscience field, and mainly because of what I'm now referring to as the neural network fallacy, and that is that the substrate of computation, the synaptic weights, is also the same substrate of learning and memory. That was a big mistake, and there are much to be discovered about actually the control of way circuits operate. I've told you nothing about that here, other than alluding to it probably with changes in parameters like bound setting and so forth. I'd love someone to ask me what I, what I was talking about there, um, but you'll have to give me another hour. So, I've, okay, I want to thank you very much for your attention. I guess I've now gone two minutes over. And, um, um, and thank the people who did the work. Um, I, maybe I forgot to mention Natalie, but she's been a big part of the, of the LIP part, uh, part of the puzzle. Uh, and um, and uh, Eric Troutman, who came to work with Mark Churchland, and he's actually working with uh, Daniel Walpert, me, and Mark on, a, on, a, on using these neuropixel probes in motor areas uh, uh, in, in terms of context-dependent movements. Um, and uh, I mentioned Anika Reddy, uh, my other collaborators, and I just I feel like I'd share you this picture that this is a, uh, un, I think most of you probably have never seen this uh, painting of um, Magritte, a self-portrait of him trying to decide whether he's going to paint Ceci n'est pas un peep or Le Clairvoyance, and, um, and this is how, that's he's rendering his decision process, as you can see. And, um, and uh, the answer was, of course, Le Clair, Clairvoyance. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Mike, for some very, very interesting data. And uh, we move to the second part of the event, which is this fireside discussion. And if you want to ask a question or discuss a topic, let me uh, please pose a general topic or question to help me organize the discussion, just so it goes well. And just to get it started while I have a chance to get organized, Marcus, you had your hand up. Go ahead. You need to mute yourself. I, I can't hear you, Marcus. OK, can you hear me now? Great. All right, super. Um, hi, Michael. Great talk. And good to see you again. Uh, doesn't happen often enough, unfortunately. <laughs> um, I had sort of a general question about, a very general question about how to interpret these findings. So 
Uh, and it relates a bit to what you said at the very end. Uh, so these monkeys have been trained for many months, uh, many thousands of trials on a task that you engineered very carefully. So it has an optimal decision policy and the policy can be captured mathematically with this uh, diffusion model, it's great. But um, you know, is it conceivable that uh, neuroplasticity in the cortex and elsewhere produces a little module in the monkey brain that's just specific for this task? And it's not surprising that within that module and within the areas that you know the module talks to, you should now see representations of these task variables because you've engineered the task to be solved that way, right? So uh, can we conclude that the monkeys make uh, real life decisions in the same way? And this relates a bit to the Bronco work that you mentioned on uh, natural decision-making. And I think also to the uh, thoughts you mentioned at the very end about how circuits get reconfigured uh and uh anyway it's a very general question and i'm sure you've been asked it many times but if you could just uh, uh humor us for a moment uh, about how we should think about this well yeah uh, my view is i it's similar to yours i mean the monkeys have been very i, I assume with your view is that the monkeys have been very highly trained in this and they've kind of encephalized something that for example doesn't even require the cortex in in um, in in so either innate behaviors or even relatively simple ones that are just part of their natural repertoire. So, but I think that when you are using, infra, so I think this is a highly contrived test that lets us see more how our brains, not not how, not not not, not trying to. I don't think this becomes. Uh, it, it, well, it, it requires a cortex, and it requires a, actually. To be honest, that's actually still up in the air. To be, but I think it's pretty reasonable to assume it. So I think my view is that it's not. It's, it's, it's not trying to be a model of all of, of all of what the monkeys do. They may they don't have to integrate information in time. I think that's a very rare thing. But it tells us probably about how our inter, how we integrate in time, how we assemble evidence and can route it to random places effectively. And of course, since we have language, we can actually do those routing, which is a control operation on the fly. Um, uh, and it's much harder for a monkey. But I think we suffer from the exact same bottlenecks, for example, in some of those controlling operations, because you can't do one more than a few at a time, or only even one in some cases. And um, so I think it's, it's, it's not really a model. It, 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 like, like all, the cortex ultimately has to talk to subcortical areas. And so, um, so all we're doing is exploiting existing circuitry in the colliculus, and yes, probably finding a way to exploit it for tasks where you have to withhold your answer while you wait for more information, and probably that's what those bumps are telling us. There are, uh, Marcos, you want to say, you want to continue or you're done with this topic? Oh, oh I, I think that's a good answer. I mean, uh, uh, that's uh, one thing I found interesting about the Tiago Branco work is that it, it relates to decisions that the animal probably has never had to make <laughs> uh, or or very few times. And, uh, you know, the, uh, the sense is that that circuitry is probably la largely innate and pre-existing and so on. Um, yeah. So an interesting possibility is that uh, for you know more cognitive like decisions that uh, we we make, we actually somehow recruit some of the pre-existing circuitry that exists for making uh, instinctive decisions and just uh, route different kinds of information into it. Uh, I, I don't know if that maybe that's implied in what you're. I totally thinking. agree. Yeah, that's exactly the way I think about it. I mean, it's, I mean, it's interesting when it's not true. Like, you know, for example, I'm very interested in, I, I was very excited about a lot of the work on par parenting behavior, which is, you could say, it's a, a, an innate behavior. And, and I thought, okay, well, the, the maybe there's a way to access those same kinds of circuits, and it could explain a lot of affective disorders or just be of interest in things like that. But, you know, and then I, I, as I follow that work, it seems like it's not an easy, I mean, David Anderson's here, you might have a good answer to this, that it isn't a direct shot. At you, at, like, there's a direct shot at the colliculus, okay? And you've shown the colliculus being used, in, in, and Tiago, too, for that matter, in, in, these, in these behaviors that we can think of are really in the repertoire of the animal, okay? And even genetically, right? Some freeze and some run fast, depending on where they are in North America, right? So, um, um, but um, but I I, I I think there are probably some exceptions to the ability to encephalize and sort of uh, glom on, but it's a to, to the existing hardware, so so to speak. But I think it's a very attractive thing. It's a very biologically inspired hypothesis. It's much better than building a random neural net and then and then diagnosing it. Okay, which is what half the field does these days.
we'll get we'll get to the neural network decoding thing later. Anyone else on this topic before we we move on? Okay. Thank you, Mike. There are several questions related to the role of the superior colliculus on the particular task that you use. Uh, Richard, Richard Anderson, please. Uh, uh, very nice uh, talk, Mike. Uh, it's uh, good to get an update on your current experiments. Uh, I wouldn't have necessarily thought of the colliculus as setting the threshold uh, you know, other targets, as you mentioned, might be uh, frontal eye fields or the basal ganglia. Uh, but it sounds like you're going to explore those areas as well. Uh, if you find that they're all setting thresholds, uh, in that case, how would you interpret that? Would you think that it's uh, somehow a network property of interactions uh, between the areas, or do you think that the superior colliculus uh, is the site of the decision? Well, I don't know, because we don't have that result yet. I mean, I would definitely, I, I, I think, I, my working hypothesis is that there are different thresholds for different things. So, for example, we have some monkeys that reach and look, you know, you can imagine who inspired that. And, um, and, they, and they don't necessarily use the same speed accuracy threshold for both. And, and I think we're doing this all the time. There are thoughts that make it into consciousness, which is just the decision to report. And then, and there are, there are uh, that's, that's the deep statement actually flying by there. And then there are, then there are de decisions that we make that are, you know, let us move our hand or move our eyes or whatever it's going to be. And some are less costly than others. You could say them energetically or whatever. And so, um, and so they make it into our knowledge states, even if they're pre-conscious. And so, um, um, and I, 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 there must be different bounds. There must be different settings. And so, so that means there's, the, I think there's a role for a lot of areas, both doing it and controlling it. Okay. So, you know, so, so I, I don't know, you know, especially when you get to a circuit that might be controlled by different of these areas, for example, reaching and looking, you know, are not going to project to the same part of the colliculus, you know. And um, if, uh, as I think you're maybe postulating that uh, for, it'll be very task dependent and that uh, different areas will um, show the threshold phenomena depending on the task. Uh, is that consistent with the, what Marcus uh, just stipulated that uh, knowledge from the cortex of cognitive are rerouted into the same circuitry because in that case you would think it would always be the colliculus. But, but well, maybe on the output side, but even in the colliculus, there's sort of let's just say the tectum. There are different places that that output would go if it's going to control, you know, body musculature versus the eyes, for example, right? So, um, but but so you know, in the end, that convergence is not something I've thought a ton about. It's a cool question, um, but. Um, but the idea that we um, can route information somewhat flexibly through learning uh, to different structures, um, that I'm totally hip to because, um, but it's, uh, that is the big trick. I mean, when people do the cost of, of neural computation, the big cost is wiring. It's, you know, I, I think we're gonna, we're gonna understand that we've been thinking about the ATP costs way too long, partly because half of the presynaptic input probably doesn't lead to anything anyway. But, um, but, but partly because the big cost is routing, and, that, and that's what takes time. For example, I mean, just to give you a little insight, is that we now think that there's, a, you know, we try to do pretty good bookkeeping with the, the times in the brain and the times in the, in the, in, in the uh, decision. And we've always been off by about 70 to 80 milliseconds, unaccounted for, between activity and empty, and it's showing up in the integral, or we think it's something like an integral, in, um, in LIP, right? And I now think that that is the bottleneck, that actually you're really sampling from what George Sperling would have called iconic, iconic um, short-term memory. And, um, and there's this difficulty in, in converting that to a signal that I actually think is a control signal. So this is a big change in the way I think about computation now, that it's a control signal that basically gives an instruction to LIP to change by delta, delta spikes per second, where delta is effectively the content of, of, a, of, of a memory. So, so I think I'm not saying I can account for the 70 milliseconds, but, but, um, but I think that's what the, that's what we're looking at because to explain a bunch of other new tasks we're doing, um, it seems like that there's a, a competition for this this the, the, what ultimately is a central bottleneck. 
So anyway, so routing is, is the issue. And, um, and yes, we can ultimately use the same output, or, or it may be that depending on what we're trying to address, reaches, say, versus eye movements, we would address different, different but we still have a routing problem, both on the coming in part, which is what I'm focused on, and, and, and also in the going out part. Thanks. Marcin, do you have a follow-up question of this? Marcin Penacon Penconac? Well, uh, yes, I, I would like to have your point of view. Uh, would you support the idea that uh, Colliculus is, is coding the actual, the result of a decision while, while in the lip area, the decision is, is, is getting formed and transformed into the final, into, into Colliculus, if you, if you know what I mean. Yes, I, I mean, it's, it is true that what, what you said is all true, but it's not um, exclusive. So for example, the LIP, the lateral intraparietal area, um, it, it represents also the, the, the final commitment because if we take a tri trial, for example, and we, we, we control the duration and not the monkey, and we make him wait through a delay period, then he holds on to that signal at the end, which is very stereotyped and says, I think it's to the right. Or basically that rightward choice target is the more salient of the two in front of me for an eye movement, okay? But so, so there are th that persistent activity, which people would associate with working memory, uh, I associate it with in a more intentional framework with a plan of a, a provisional affordance, really. But, um, but what, however you want to interpret it is sitting in lots of places. So it's not just, it's, the, the colliculus is not the sole proprietor. It is in this task because what we say to the monkey is when you've made your decision, indicate it with an eye movement. And, you know, with the human, same thing, they'll follow that. Oh, nice to see you. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> Martin, you want to say some follow up or you're okay? No, 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 I'm fine. I have another question, but maybe it falls into. It's in another topic. If you don't mind uh, posting it in the chat so I can coordinate. Mike, I want to take my prerogative as moderator and ask a follow up question on this. So here is an alternative interpretation of your beautiful new data inspired by previous work of yours. Okay. But it's, I think it's different. I, I want to know what I'm missing. How do you kill this? So the idea is this imagine that you're an area, let's call it the SC that is not involved in the decision per se of reaching a threshold and deciding what's okay to make, when and what's okay to make. But instead your job is to sit there. So you're a group of neurons that sits there and decides, I'm gonna get a command from someone else. When it comes, the decision has been made and my job is to initiate, communicate to everyone, to, to the motor, uh, I, 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 I visual motor system or myself to actually initiate the choice. So I'm sitting there and my job, I do two computations, I keep track of where you are on the integration just in case I have to initiate, to initiate it quickly. But once that is strong enough, then I need to run myself up. I need to warm up. So there's some sort of self-loop cycle within that takes time. And that's why you get the two types of burst. Now, the key thing is why does the burst sometimes go all the way through and sometimes stop? And this is where it comes from your previous work because LIP keeps computing the derivative. So sometimes extra information comes back that tells me, no, 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 wait, 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 don't get all worked up and start the decision because I was actually wrong. Okay, so basically, you see what I'm saying? Now, in this interpretation, I think you can explain your bombs and a bunch of other things, but you cannot conclude that this is involved in the threshold. It's actually a post threshold interpretation. What am I missing? Um, I'm not sure I completely follow you, but let, let's, I'll just ask you a few questions back. Does your account, this, this alternative account, does it accommodate that the level in LIP uh, matters, that it's the level and the, and the that derivative? Yeah, okay. So you're just saying, all you're saying is that, that the colliculus is sort of mirroring some other, there's some other structure doing the things that I'm postulating, and that, and that the colliculus, because it's this little motor thing, it just, it ends up, uh, it, it's getting this information somehow and it changes its mind or something. Yeah, I, no, it's not a it change its mind. It's that it's, its job is to initiate or so, yeah. initiate the action, not to make the decision. But to do that, it needs to, once it decides it's time, it needs to wrap itself. That's why it takes time to go over the bump. But it also wants to be prepared. So it, can, it kind of pre warm the motors, pre warm the circuit as a function of what's going on in LIP and other things. That's why you see the initial ramp the initial ramping up, just like in LIP, the separation. But the key thing is once it thinks it has to go, it initiates the bump, but the bump takes time. So it can be a stop if new information from LIP comes. 
before he has actually initiated this attack. Yeah, I, I don't know. I think you'd have a hard, first of all, I, I do like the idea, but we're on the same page in terms of thinking about this sort of recursive, um, explosive kind of um, um, mechanism within, and it'd be fantastic to understand that's the kind of thing that Tiago's after. But Tiago Branco, um, but um, but but I, I so that part's fine, and um, I think I think the things that should bother you are is that the Musimol experiment in um, in in Caliculus causes a change in one bound. I just don't understand how we're gonna how we're gonna bring that into the the Caliculus as a mirror of something happening someplace else. If we, we put a hole in the Caliculus, and what we do is, is we get this change in the bound that changes the choices and the reaction times all, you know, in this very asymmetric way, I think it's hard, to, it's hard to not link it into the decision process and therefore the bounds. I'm not saying it's actually setting the bound, to be honest. I need to think, Mike. That, that's a good, the last part is a good point. Um, Whitney, you wanted to ask a question regarding to the SC. It's the last question on this. Whitney Griggs? We lost Whitney. Now, there are a bunch of people who want to ask you to talk about the learning and the neuro neurons. Sorry, Whitney. Oh, Whitney, you're there. Please unmute yourself. I, I couldn't hear yes. you. Sorry about yes. that. Sorry, I had that connection. Yeah. No, it's fine. Yeah, uh, thank you for the talk, Mike. I was interested whether these were intermediate superior clicklist neurons and whether these were like visual psychotic or just pure psychotic neurons to try and get a sense of whether these are like the same neurons like Michelle Basso or like Rich Krauslis have been recording from. Yeah, they're, 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 inter they're mainly intermediate. They're intermediate and deep. In the deep, we find just the pure uh, burst neurons, but these are the ones that have uh, persistent activity in memory saccades. So, so they are yeah, the same neurons, I think, that Michelle and Rich record from, yeah. Uh, I should have told you that, I'm sorry. Okay, now let's switch topics. I think you trigger my uh, PhD student, Pantelis, so he wants to ask you about it. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for the very nice talk. Um, yeah, I just wanted to ask for this uh, last point you made. Uh, you seem to suggest that, uh, you know, uh, neural net-like changes is not everything, is, it does not explain everything about memory and kind of suggested the network switching mechanism. So I wanted to, uh hear your thoughts on that a little bit in more detail and how control could be implemented if not via learning then maybe through dynamics yeah i think we i mean i'm going to i'm going to continue to take kind of cheap shots here so you know having said like you know i i'm i'm, I'm super positive about theory and some you know i you know i interact with people i love to argue with and it's all very in in all in love and respect okay so so just you know but i like to be a little bit funny and obnoxious it's just in my blood i guess but um but it's not that it's not that you cannot um, get random neural networks and and interactions between them to to create control like processes you know you know create hierarchies and stuff and um, uh, and I in fact I'm fascinated by those mathematical models you know uh, but but you know when we you know math in some ways is just a tool for us to to understand make help us make predictions and also in some ways it's a metaphor you know we we know that the neurons are doing biological things you know so i mean this is the big problem with the bayesian brain yeah, but we can we don't we don't want to digress into that but um but um but my my thought is that that and this is the cheap the cheap part of the answer is that is that um, we don't know there is a lot that lives in the darkness of biology because the world has gotten consumed by hopfield nets and all of the and all of its progeny and, um, and 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 it is so powerful that we don't look so we don't understand what apical dendrites are for we don't understand how you know dendritic branches are selected and not selected we don't understand what all that calcium signals are doing we don't understand what most of the neuropeptides are doing and and, and when we understand that stuff i bet you will be able to have like less embarrassing answers to our friends who ask us how the hallucinogens work and stuff like that um, it's because we there is a firewall between the, the cognitive scientists have, have had it right. There's a firewall between control and processing. So that's the point of view that they take. Um, but the neuroscientists don't do that. We, we I, think could you unpack these control. words firewall between control and processing just just for the purpose of helping everybody make sure we understand exactly what you mean. 
I mean that that so we can we I'll be a little fuzzy on the border of what's a controlling operation versus a processing. But processing is the kind of thing we talk about with firing rates that are changing and they mean a, a more or less of some quantity and they get combined in linear and nonlinear ways with other things. And these are, these are the computations. And integration is a simple one, transduction of motion energy is another one, and so forth. All the things I talk today, about today, for the most part, were processing. And that's always how I've thought about, 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 neuro, about <laughs> neural responses. But, there's, but the controlling operations, the, you know, the, the, the poster child for that, for the cognitive scientists, is, is attention. Don't think about how neuroscientists is explain attention, but the way they think of attention, it's a routing problem, okay? The way I think about attention is it's, it's an interrogation problem. It's the brain say, asking a question of the world, okay? And so, um, um, and, and that, that just kind of means I'm looking for something that would bear evidence bearing on some proposition, okay? That's the way, I think that's the way to think about the structure of information in the brain, period, okay? And a lot of problems go away when you do. Okay, so now, so, so I don't know what I, what I, if I want to give you an example of an example, but, but let's, you know, if we talked about feedback, okay, people, okay, here's an example where we're all messed up because we think of feedback as sending some error signal or a different signal, something that helps you build a common filter, something that, you know, but the fact of the matter is, is that feedback makes no sense in those terms because of three reasons. One is the neurons that feedback are speaking a different language than the neurons that they're feeding back to. They have a different size receptive fields or they live in a different frame of reference or whatever, or they compute something that can't even be converted. It's like completely orthogonal. And, and, and when they feed back, they fan into an area and they can't possibly know who to pick out. Oh, wait a second. Maybe they could if there was a, a, a calcium signal in apical spike that changed the biology of the apical dendrite so that implicitly you could pick it out. Okay? So there's all kinds of things, and we don't know, this is back to Pantelis, is that we don't know we don't, about these things. And the reason we don't know about them is because people think we already understand them because they build neural networks that, that can reproduce them functionally, but not biologically. Yeah, actually, I absolutely agree with that, and I'm actually very excited about this dendritic apical stuff as well. Oh, then we have to talk more. It's rare I ever hear anyone say that, yeah. other than Matthew Larkham, who's my hero yeah, in that. Exactly. Yeah. Mike, but to finish this uh, particular subtopic, and again, for the purpose of educating all of us, can you suggest stuff, uh, one review to read in these views that you're discussing by you or by someone else? People that I think have thought hard about this and pushed for it, and they push for it in different ways over the last 20 years, um, is just the people that have been interested in, a, in, in dendritic computation. There's a lot of stuff that was wrong. Dendrites as massive computers. That's your colleague Christoph, or maybe he's not your colleague anymore. But, um, um, but I don't know what he thinks about that anymore. And for a long time, Bartlett Mel was in that category, okay? But he's not now. I think he thinks about dendritic control of, of, of the way the circuit's going to operate. But I don't know a review that, that, that Matthew Larkham's written. I would just re read a ton of his papers because every one of them from the very beginning about you change, you change an active conductance in a dendrite and you change the, in a basal dendrite and you change the way the whole neuron computes. And that's how I got to know him because I thought that might generate to how the whole circuit computes. And that's where this, what I call the circuit configuration problem came, comes from. Thank you, Michael. Before we change topics, there is a very closely related question by Omero. Omero, are you still in the line? Can you give us a Hey, yeah, uh, I think it's just a, a kind of a follow up. I, I, so there's this paper in 2018 um, from actually the lab that I was at uh, a few years ago. Um, so where they proposed uh, an algorithm to do game modulation to control uh, movements. And I, when you when you made your comment about not using synap just synaptic plasticity to control the brain. Uh, I remember of that paper and wondered if, if that was what you were talking about. Now you, you talked about dendritics, but is it? Yeah, I think you already answered the question, but uh, yeah, but, if you want but, to comment a little bit. I, I'm glad you brought that up. I, do, I don't know the paper you're talking about, but... Um, but in, case I, I if, in case it helps, it's, it's, Stroud, uh, it's from the Bogles lab, Nature Neuro, Motor Primitives in Space and Time Via Targeted Game Modulation in Cortical Networks, in case it helps. Okay. Well, but I just want to say a more general thing because I'm not going to be able to say anything specific. But um, it's that I don't want to say that synaptic plasticity doesn't matter. It's just that there's a kind of a firewall between the operations 
that probably are happening, I don't know about basal dendrites so much, but you know, but I would say far from spike generation in the soma, and there's a whole bi biology going on in layers one and two, the like first hundred microns of what people always call it layer two, three, um, that is uh, all about you know, getting information, often it's long range feedback if you're thinking about those layers, and, um, and, um, and, uh, and changing the way, doing something with the way the circuit changes. I mean, this is, I don't want to get into our mouse work, but, but if you read my paper with, it's, it's, it's Zheng Wu, is, he goes by Herbert, with, and it's a collaboration between Richard Axel and me, uh, the few other authors. And, um, but if you read that paper, it seems to be about delayed match the sample, and we kind of make it clear that it's also about exclusive OR, but it's really about context-dependent changes in the way a circuit operates, and that's why I did this thing, because we see that happening every day in the monkey, but we don't know how it works because it happens under the radar of spiking. You know? So, um, and that's what I mean by the firewall. It's not a perfect firewall in the brain. I mean, there, is, there are, you know, attention does change the way that the neurons fire. I'm not arguing in any way with the data, but I think we should think differently. And when we do, the so same synaptic uh, pl plasticity mechanisms will be at play. The, you know, the beautiful work that goes down to biochemistry, you know, um, will, will undoubtedly be at play. And so it's not like we haven't benefited from the science, especially the biology side. I'm not so sure about the neural network side. Thank you, Michael. Let's uh, switch to another, I think, big topic that would be of interest. Uh, John O'Doherty, please. Hi, Mike. Thank you for a yeah. great talk. Um, yeah, I just wanted to uh, maybe push you because uh, you mentioned something about um, uh, the redundancy in the decision network. And you alluded to some data suggesting inactivation of LIP um, can uh, may not you know may not produce uh, behavioral deficits necessarily on some kinds of decisions. So I was wondering, you, you said you, you had something to say about that, uh, an update on some new data. So I was wondering if, if you could kind of elaborate on that question. Sure. Yeah. I mean, so you can imagine that we've also done almost as a comparison in this experiment, Musimol in LIP. And what we see is a change in, um, in a bias for the most part, and a subtle change in even the slope of the function in some experiments, but not all. And but the interesting thing about these inactivation experiments in cortex is that they're not long lasting. There's a compensation that occurs. The, the cells are still silent, but behaviorally you see after about 400 trials, the effect's gone. And when we've done experiments like that, with, we've also done a whole set of experiments where we do Musimol and DREDS, um, different monkeys in, um, in, in, in the, we map out where is all of the information, because we always think that the, maybe one reason you got a small effect is that you don't have a clustered organization of the cells, right? We take advantage of that in the colliculus, right? Um, and we take advantage now of these electrodes that can sample from tons of neurons to get like all the, all the cells in our field anyway that are, that are relevant. But when we make a lot of injections, either of the virus for the dreads or of the mucimol for the, in the, in the, in, in the chemogen, in, in, in the pharmacology experiments, then what we see is the same kind of thing. We see, we see the main deficit, which is trivial really, is a hemi neglect. And um, the thing that's always bothered me are experiments where someone finds a hemi neglect, I'm thinking of a specific paper now, but where someone finds a hemi neglect in some control, and then they don't find any evidence of that in the decision. And that always clues me that they're, they are not really, the monkeys from their perspective aren't making difficult decisions. That's the way I think about that. But another possibility is that they're just getting very fast compensation. And I'm really interested, I have a whole, a whole you know, a side of the lab now that's going to start studying compensation because, I mean, it's, you know, it's bad news for causal causal uh, neuroscience, but it's really good news for something potentially therapeutic, if you think about it. So I'd like to understand how that works. And there's something that seems very different about inhibition and excitation. Just to, just to follow up, I mean, do you think that in the monkey preparation where there's been a lot of training, um, that the circuit, you know, that you tend to see much more rapid compensation because the circuits are kind of, you know, these processes are kind of really baked in with overtraining. Um, do you think you would see less compensation with less training? Uh, I, you couldn't do the experiment, right? Because the monkey needs to be trained to do it. And, you know, and by the way, I mean, people keep thinking these monkeys, I hate when people say overtrained, because the monkeys, they pick up the task pretty quickly. You know, I mean, a good trainer gets the monkey doing the random dots in, in five days or something. It takes me one day to train them on that memory saccade. They're pretty smart. And, um, 
And, um, but, um, but what you have to do is you have to get them like to do threshold psychophysics and you know, work, work really hard to do the difficult cases and uh, be able to do them with geometries that you can't anticipate until you have a neuron. So they have to learn where the, you know, the dots could be in different places, the targets can be in different places and stuff like that and they, they have to learn all that. So that's, that's what takes a long time, that and getting down the thresholds. The fact is humans, when we do human work, they, they, they take a few sessions before they get down to asymptotic levels. Um, they never start, let's put it this way, at their asymptote. Um, so I don't know about that, but, um, but I, I'm definitely, I think it makes sense if they're, if they're less well-trained or if they're less trained, then sure, they might compensate faster. It'd be something worth looking at. Thank you. Uh, Marcin wants to revisit the superior curricular and LIP relationship. Go ahead. Yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> so, um, so the question is, uh, if 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 we say that, or if we kind of imagine that uh, the leap area is projecting to colliculus, uh, could the bumps be be the result of uh, high firing in in some subpopulation of the lip, whereas bursts are simply, you know, activated when 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 the whole population of the lip or a bigger population of the lip is active or you know with higher ring with high frequency yeah we can't exclude that i mean we'd have to say that there's a correlation then between the the um you know if we look at that difference between what preceded what when we did i did time aligned lip in the right to to when we thought a bump or a burst was beginning to begin, and we made the comparison, right? And the bumps and bursts, you know, begin with the same, on, they have the same chain delta, right? Um, uh, and, and, uh, and, and so that's just a matter of frequency of when you see them, and they have various varied sizes. Why some get bigger than others, I don't know. And, and it may well be that different neurons are active or more neurons are active. And um, so, um, but, um, but I think we still would have to account for the fact that, that the difference between the ones that the, in our, in our subpopulation, which is just thought to be a rep representative uh, of a larger population, okay? It's, uh, that's, uh, that's worth actually thinking a little harder. I'm going to say something else obnoxious, but, but we think really hard about what that statement, when we have a selection of neurons that we decide to average together, that's a strong hypothesis that they are represent, they represent some larger group because after all we got them at random. Now when, a, when someone gives me an analysis of something that they're representing in a hundred dimensional space, they, I don't think they thought really hard about the degree to which that hundred dimensional space is representative of a random hundred dimensional space of some hundred thousand dimensional space, you know, whatever, whatever they think. I think they really think that it's a subspace of a larger space. But I think that's, that's worth thinking really, really hard about, about, you know, but, but for anyway, for me, yes, if there are probably more neurons in LIP that are, that didn't make it onto our electrode that are doing something like what our subset in the case I showed you of seven are doing. It's reassuring that when we go to larger, like, you know, we haven't gotten much above 20, but, um, but when we get to 20 or something, I mean, we get better looking versions of what we see with you know seven so you know we don't we're not seeing new features for what it's worth but but there is a there is an analysis we're doing now in the lab it's very open-ended which is not to ignore all those other neurons and so i'm you know i'm doing a bunch of techniques I, i'm usually like a kind of a naysayer in in the world of high dimensional analyses you know i think it's mostly obfuscation and and crappy data sets really or just not knowing what you're, you know you're in the wrong area you did a somatosensory experiment in the visual cortex or something let's decode it you know so um but 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 that's the naysayer in you but i'm actually i think those techniques are extremely useful for finding signals that you don't understand you know system identification so so um you know we're involved in doing that some of them to try to explain the things we're seeing in the brain and the neurons that we think we do understand and some of them just to relate to the behavior on their own in some way so, for example, I think there are, there, as thinking of control signals, there are, there are signals that parse that are going to be, I think, we, you know, you, there are certain things that can't happen unless the, that circuit somehow knows that it's a time that it can have a response, or it knows, for example, that it should stop integrating. That's probably, we think, a signal that's related to what's coming back from the colliculus. We have no idea. And, you know, I would, to go back to Richard's question, if I had to pick an area, I would have think, thought that was the frontal eye field to LIP connection. But who knows? Okay, anyway, that, that's a long way of saying yes, I agree, there's <laughs> more to it. Everyone, we've come to the end of the event. Let me help uh, 
thank you, Michael, so much for an amazing talk. And it's always such a treat. I had missed uh, seeing him. Uh, so I really enjoyed this. And for everyone, we are taking a break on the webinar for the summer, but we'll be back on the fall. Nice to see you. Enjoy the weather and the, for at least for a while, and no masks if you're vaccinated, only if you're vaccinated. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye everyone. Thank you very much.